Stephen Hackett, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Whenever I'm talking to you, it's because something good just happened. And uh, this time, <laughs> this time, it's um, I'm usually not this pumped for any of the consumer products. Like when there's a consumer Mac that comes out, I'm like, that's great for someone else. I'll try to look at it in terms of how I could imagine a mainstream consumer might appreciate it. Right now, we've got some brand new 24-inch iMacs. I'm sitting yeah. in front of one right now, and I have not been I've not been this excited uh, about you know like a product that's really for everybody in so long. No, it's it's not just you. I, I feel the same way. I think it's exciting because obviously you got this huge redesign, which I have many questions for you about, and uh, and it's just cool to see Apple kind of bring back the flair and the fun of the, you know, the original iMac from way back when. So yeah, even though this is not a computer that's going to replace, you know, my workstation, that doesn't mean I'm not super psyched about it. I think when it first was announced, there was a lot of, I don't know, everybody knew that this wasn't supposed to be the pro one kind of like we'd, we talked, we had all talked about that. All the, all the podcasts and all the YouTubers had said like, okay, <laughs> this is the, this is the entry level one, but still the response seemed to forget that. To me, like it still seemed like most yeah. people were like, oh, but it's not black and it's not, uh, it doesn't have five different M1 processors in it. It doesn't have an MX. It doesn't, you know, on and on. And it's like, but didn't we all agree that this was the, the one for the mainstream? Yeah, I found that funny too, because the M1 is so good in the MacBook Air and the 13-inch MacBook Pro. We've all been praising it now for, you know, coming up on six months that it's been out, I guess. But then, yeah, this iMac comes out, and I think it is a little bit to do what we just talked about, that it is such an attractive machine, and like part of me wishes that I could use it, mm -hmm. but because it's the M1, it doesn't quite meet my needs yet. I think a lot of us are just kind of we're ready to see what's next, and so this machine didn't really move that ball forward in performance, even though it completely demolishes the old 21 and a half inch Intel machine that it replaces. Wait, where, so where are you with M ones right now? You are, do you have one that you've been working on often or have you just kind of played with them or? Yeah. So I have the 13 inch MacBook pro is my secondary machine. My daily driver is a 2019 Mac pro. And so that, that notebook is secondary. It's if I work outside of the studio or somewhere, which, uh, doesn't happen very often, of course, in, uh, in these, uh, this era of pandemic, but um, I've been really impressed with it and the performance is great. I never hear the fans and that's, you know, including some podcast editing and recording that I've done on it just to try to push it. Mm -hmm. And the M1 just, it'll take what you give it and just run it amazingly quietly and smoothly. And so that all translates to this iMac being, I assume, a really good computer, even if it's not quite the one for all of us. And I think some people sort of felt kind of stuck in the middle a little bit. Well, and let's clear that up a bit. So for anybody that doesn't already know this, it's, it is the same M1. So we got mostly the same guts in here. It's not going to be a radically different computer anyway. Um, the, the real change is that it has bigger fans. So even compared to the 13-inch MacBook Pro, under long, it, the sustained loads that it can stay cooler and therefore mm -hmm. run without any throttling, that time is longer. That's the biggest difference we're going to see. Everything else in like shorter term measurements and anything else that may have been limitations, especially like maybe in terms of RAM, that's all still there as well. So I, I think from my experience so far on it, which has only been a few days, but is like it is exactly the same most of the time except when you export video, like a long video, then you can, right. eventually you'll start to feel that difference because the fans do more. They are just bigger. Mm -hmm. Other than that, we're, we're hitting the same performances on everything else and everything, including the iPad now. So the iPad Pro. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually the only M1 machine with two fans in it. The MacBook Pro and the Mac Mini are single fan enclosures. And so, yeah, I would expect that what you have found that in the those really long drawn out processes, it is a little bit better, but the M1 is still the M1. It's going to mm -hmm. act the way that it does and perform the way that it does. And I think we're probably just speaking around the margin about how it may be slightly different here or there based on the enclosure. Well, so what have you run into in your M1 experience so far? And a side note, of th this is one thing I've realized with this is that it's made it 
le- it's kind of going to give us less to talk about. I've realized like this is great for consumers because it's less complicated to choose. When you're going shopping, you don't need to know as much about your next computer. But as pundits or you know people that talk about this all the time, it's like, <laughs> oh, there's a little less to talk about because it's a little easier to understand, which is you know good for good for people. Yeah, all that nuance of oh, this is the seven watt Intel Core i five, but this one's the thirteen watt Core i five. It's like people mm-hmm, don't care about mm-hmm. that, but we care about it. Our audiences care about it. Uh, so you're right; it does simplify things uh, in a way. You know, a lot of my workflow is is audio as a podcast recorder and producer, and the M one has been absolutely astounding at the tasks that I've I've thrown at it. It, it doesn't necessarily make things like exporting from Logic, you know, all that much faster. But what I've been impressed with is even in multi-track recording or in big, uh, big edits, it's always smooth. And so sometimes in Logic in particular, if you have a lot of cuts or a lot of tracks and you start moving things around, Logic will get stuttery and mm-hmm. it'll kind of like you're waiting for Logic to catch up with you. Now, that's definitely been the case uh, for me on other MacBook Pros over the years. And this M1 just sails through it. And yes, yeah, not night and day speed difference, but it does it with its uh, without getting its hair messed up, so to speak, right? It's not hot. It's not blasting the fans all the time. Right. It is just cool and collected no matter what. And for a machine that's primary purpose for me is audio production, that's really important you know if you go back to the iMac Pro a few years ago that's why I moved to the iMac Pro when it came out because the iMac was noisy under load and the iMac Pro wasn't it's always something I'm chasing in my machines and so if that's a consideration for you the M1 just uh, I was going to say the M1 blows away the other machines in terms of fan noise then I wasn't going to say it. Now I've said it. So yeah, well, here we it's, are. it's out there. I mean, that's gonna it's gonna be in the description of the show now. Um, <laughs> the yeah, it's like I remind me to come back and say something bad about this later because it's easy for me to just gush for a long time because there are so many good things. Um, but w- th- this is this ties into why standard bench like benchmarking software is so useless because the most interesting things about the performance are are things that come up regularly but aren't necessarily um d- just don't appear as much in synthetics. So my my good example in video editing is we uh have been shooting on the Canon C70 which is using codecs that are heavier on our older machines. And this is re- really common with any of the modern c- cameras that have come out, same thing with the A7S3 or with the uh, what are the other cameras that are, oh, the Canon R5. Everything is like super slow on even previous generation Mac Pros. For some reason, M1s just cut through that like nothing. So it's cool. <laughs> that that sounds, you know, that sounds like pretty good at first, but you start to realize that adds up over a few hours to much more time efficiency than a faster export time because you're only exporting you know, two or three times in a whole project, you ever export it. But instead of having to generate proxies and having to, uh, you know, wait for things, I mean, the, it, just when you add a new color correction layer or you add a new audio filter and all of a sudden everything gets bogged down, that's what completely kills your workflow. Um, so I, you have the all the biggest benefits are that these new cameras that have gotten really slow on every older machine your minute to minute experience is incredibly smooth and you just blast through it. And yeah. I think it's, it's hard. You need somebody to like describe that to get you excited about it. Cause just seeing a stack of numbers doesn't express how much time that's actually saving you in the day. So like we're not having to generate proxies when we had to before. Um, we do still get basically the same limitations in terms of export. So when we're you know, processing it out, it's not way faster. Sometimes it might be a little slower, but it's it's huge for that keeping up momentum of going mm-hmm. through an edit. And I haven't been doing much audio editing, but I imagine same for you. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, your first Mac that you got with an SSD in it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, mm-hmm. everything I touch is faster and smoother. I don't think it's to the same extent going from a hard drive to an SSD was, but it's that same idea of every little thing I do is going to be smoother and uh, less disruptive to the other things I'm doing 
on the system. And what's impressive about it is that it is kind of coming back to our point. This is the consumer processor. These are the slowest Apple <laughs> Silicon Macs we're yeah, ever going yeah. to see. Yeah, this is the and worst it'll ever be. Yeah, which is incredible. But, you mm -hmm. know, there are real limitations. The 16 gigabyte of RAM ceiling is an issue for some workflows. You have, uh, it seems like two terabytes is a storage limitation. I don't think they've had a machine go past that yet on the M1. And I think the biggest one for a, a lot of people, including me, if you have interfaces and stuff, is rather limited I.O. Only two Thunderbolt yes. ports and a couple of USB ports. They got a, a, a HDMI port on the, uh, the Mac Mini. But it is not a system that you could drop in and replace an iMac Pro with if you're using all of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. If you bought an iMac Pro because your workflow needs 64 gigabytes of RAM, this can't meet you there quite yet. And we're at this interesting place with RAM as well that it's it's getting harder to tell when you are hitting RAM, like when RAM really is slowing you down because of that. And again, I'm like, I'm talking at the edge of my understanding here. I, I see results from it, but I don't really know what's happening. But effectively, you know, SSDs and having everything on the same chip, faster SSDs, I should say, mm -hmm. and then having the whole system on a chip means that even as you start to run out of RAM, it's able to access caches and, and swap right. files more quickly so that complete locking up feeling that you used to have isn't really there anymore. Now it's much more um, like you, even if you're watching your RAM fill up, it'll start just swapping things out of like throwing things out of the RAM and pulling them from the hard drive. And you may not be noticing it as much. So I've had a harder time knowing like, when is the RAM the bottleneck for me? Like it's not as clear anymore. I don't, it, it in, in fact, in, in general, I feel like I kind of need to relearn how the flow of the system is because our bottlenecks are going to end up being in different places. Like for example, the GPU, you know, now we're using a, a mobile GPU that probably will end up slowing down various kinds of software in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. Although uh, my editor, Marco uh, has been doing cinema 4d on the M one uh, 13 inch MacBook pro and says it just blows away his iMac. So yeah, that's a good sign. Yeah, that is interesting, right? Because in the olden days, when you paged out of RAM and you had to go and put data on the spinning hard drive or get it back, the speed difference was like falling off a cliff, right? It's like, oh, and here we are. Uh, but now I agree with you, that's not the case. Uh, I don't think it's been the case for a long while for most users. And even those of us who are more demanding, as the SSDs have gotten faster and faster, that gap has closed. Now, RAM is still technically way faster than a solid state drive, even Apple's like on the board special stuff. But the gap has closed enough where most people can't really tell mm. where that's going. And in fact, in the M1, it's interesting, Apple doesn't even call it RAM. It's a unified memory because the GPU and CPU can pull from it. Even though that's been the case on Macs with integrated graphics, uh, it's... Uh, it's kind of this different world. And so the the old ways of thinking about performance, some of them are still relevant, like core count and the clock speed, but Apple doesn't tell us the clock speed <laughs> right. of these, right? I think some people have kind yeah, of worked it out, but weird. It's it's super weird. And it's like you go and buy one of these iMacs or the MacBook Air, and you can choose, well, do I want the seven core GPU or the eight core GPU? I'm like, most people are just gonna get the cheapest thing probably and it is seven eights as good as the other gpu and like it's been abstracted away in a way that apple really likes to abstract away technology and sometimes that's frustrating for professional users but i think in this case you're going to get something that performs really well it's going to meet the needs of almost every human being who would ever use a mac it's faster than almost every mac ever made and now you can get it in a bunch of fun colors and so i think that's why this this imac in particular is so exciting that makes it sound pretty good. Um, well, okay, so so far most of what we've talked about has been general M1 stuff. Like this is already applicable to the other computers we've been using for a little while. Uh, I am sitting in front of a new iMac. Uh, maybe maybe you not, I, I don't think you've played with one yet. Like what, I'm not. Do you, hit, hit me with some questions. Maybe you can prompt me into saying the most yeah. interesting things I've noticed about it. Yeah, the, the number one question I wanted to ask you in particular when we set this up was, and, and Apple got a lot of heat 
on Twitter and podcasts and stuff when this was shown off is that the bezels on the front of the machine aren't black. Now they're not mm-hmm. white either. Mm-hmm. Apple, I think, refers to them as a as a gray. And I'm <laughs> as you look around and see. Uh, but I'm very curious to see what you think of them and how uh, how that change could change the way your brain sort of works with what's on the display. Well, yeah, you def- you found the the sore spot. Like if there's one place that I can, if you want me to say anything bad about it, this is where it's going to be. Uh, my first reaction was completely negative to the white bezels because I've never, that's the reason I've not bought white iPhones. Like I've, or, you know, the silver or gold, anything that had the white front is yeah. because of the front. I liked the colors. I liked everything happening in the back, but I don't want a white front to anything that I'm using. Um, I think a lot of the Twitter reaction was a bit overblown because the reality Weird, that again, doesn't happen on Twitter. Come on. <laughs> yeah. What? what? <laughs> um, well, th- yeah, it's like normal people will like this. It is not, mm-hmm. it does not bother them just like the white iPhones didn't. And I'm sure that's what I, Apple is looking at. Like they see professional editors complaining about it, but they're like, yeah, but we know what people really thought of these iPhones. They sold like crazy. People had no problem with it. It's going to be the same situation here. Mm-hmm. So I think in, just in terms of a design choice, when you're just looking at renders, I don't think it's the wrong choice. I think it also differentiates the pro models more. So once the pro ones come, these will look even more sort of like pl- playful and more like family oriented than, yeah. um, you know, it, it'll be another differentiator. So the pro ones are, are more badass. But so, so you you expect a uh, a more pro iMac or a bigger iMac whatever it is yeah, to retain 100%. the black bezels. It will have black. I would be shocked if it's white. It, it will yeah. not have white. But okay, but now it being in my reality, I I do, I don't really like the execution of it. The thing that happens is it is um the white is is in the back of the glass. So it's like there's there's a glass front which is you know very well made of course like up to Apple standards. And then there is sort of white backing behind it. So as light comes in from the sides, you can get a pretty strong glow across it. So it doesn't feel mm. it. I, you're saying, yeah, Apple doesn't call it white, but it's it's much more like transparent. Like I've heard, you know, polar bear fur isn't white. It's it's clear. Um, and it, that like the, the way that it the st- light is refracting through it is what makes you perceive it as white. It's reminding me of that. And as light comes in from different angles, it'll glow in different shapes. So you'll almost mm. have like uneven whiteness around the edge. And then on the inside corner, there is visible black between the white and the actual screen. And I'm kind of surprised that happened. Like if you if you look at an iPhone that has a, I mean, mine doesn't have, have white, but mine has black. But when, when there is a white screen, you don't see an edge. There's, I believe, right? Like, I don't think there's like a little lip of black surrounding the, between the white and the actual screen. Right. But it, it's, it's quite visible. It's like a hmm. good millimeter and a half, two millimeters uh, of kind of black border. And I really wish there was just this like perfect, clean definition of like screen, white, that's it. Um, so yeah, the execution feels a little less than I expected, I guess. I just, I just thought it was going to be perfect and it's like, oh yeah, I can, I can see the seams in ways that, that I didn't anticipate. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. I would have assumed that the, the lit up (laughs) pixels would go right (laughs) to the white glass. Yeah. Uh, it kind of reminds me, I don't, I don't think it's super similar, but if you take a, a non-pro iPhone, like an 11 or 12, and turn the flashlight on, the light sort of diffuses through the exactly. glass on the back. Yes, that's it. And like, that's kind of a cool look, <laughs> but I could see that being really distracting depending on where you put your iMac, right? Like, totally. I'm if in a, a, a bunker with no windows, but if you've got a bunch of natural light coming in, and I could see that even changing throughout the day and that being distracting. Well, or the setup that I was looking at it with the other day is that I was sideways to the window, so the glass on the left was brighter and whiter than the glass on the right. Like there was a difference in how much it was being illuminated. And that doesn't ch- change your experience really, but I don't want anything to look at in the bezels, right? That, mm-hmm. And that's part of why I don't want them to be white as well, is I just want to keep my eyes away from them. I want everything to be pulling my eyes towards the screen. Um, for cons- like mainstream audience that this is built for, they will not care about that. But yeah. I do notice it, and, and I do dislike it. On the pro side, I, one thing I think people are overacting with, uh, this was in my YouTube video about it, but 
is that it's like, oh, if you're color correcting, it's going to throw off your colors. Most people are in a room that is not color controlled. Like they don't have 5,600 Kelvin perfectly clean lighting and uh, neutral gray walls and like no art <laughs> or like, you know, if like I'm at a wooden table right now, having though any of those things in your periphery is changing your perception more than a, a white bezel. Like the, the bezel is not screwing you up. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think it's a great argument for um, color perception for most even professional photography and video editing um, because it's only at like the highest level where you are controlling stuff enough that you would become Mm -hmm. sensitive to the fact that the computer is a different color or that it's white around the edges. Mm. Maybe there's a a business here where we could sell some like black vinyl and it goes around the sides. So there's no refraction over the bezels. I could do, I could do it right now. Yeah. I, Let's I do could, it. Yeah. There we'll we go. Take on D brand. You did just, yeah. Just do the whole thing in like black duct tape and, uh, you don't have a colorful yeah. iMac anymore. This episode is brought to you by Flipboard. And the best way to experience Flipboard, find out what it is, click the link in the show notes and check out the storyboard that I made about this episode. There's a few different ways to experience Flipboard. It's kind of like a magazine, presents all this beautifully laid out, simple to read content, but you can customize it a lot too. So I created some custom storyboards, which is like an organized set of articles and videos and just links to anything that's relevant to what we're talking about today. So you can get this fuller uh, multimedia experience of the things that we're going through. And then I also keep up to date a bunch of different magazines about specific topics. So like I have one about Apple and photography and filmmaking, but then I also have one that's like videos I've been watching on YouTube lately. So you can just get an idea of what I've been into lately, but there's also ways that you can just follow a topic overall. So I've followed like technology, Apple, photography, and you can customize what elements of that is important to you. Like there's this little icon that you can click. And then inside of that, I've said that, you know, I'm into, Canon cameras and travel photography and street photography, but not so much Nikon or DSLR cameras or, you know, there's a bunch of subcategories that you can get specific on so that your feed is exactly what you're really into on that topic. So same thing with Apple. I've got all these articles that I follow, but I could go in and I could customize that, you know, like I specifically want to find out more about AirTags and I want to know more about Steve Jobs articles. And then all this stuff is just presented to me without having to go and find this. It comes from all of my favorite blogs that I'm already reading put together in one place on Flipboard. It's a free app and just a great way to experience content in a visually beautiful and intuitive navigation way that is is really fun to use. So either click the link in the description or you can just go to flipboard.com slash Stallman to see the things that I've been posting about lately. There's a lot in there and it's constantly being updated. So thanks again to Flipboard for supporting the show and stay tuned to find out more about them in future videos. I was shocked that anybody was not excited about these colors. Like again, yeah, I know Twitter, Twitter is going to Twitter, but like it just, it looked so good to me when it was announced. So mine is the yellow, um, which uh, I was, it's what I, I, I wanted. I, I requested yellow. I was very excited for it. And I think it will be the least popular color, yep. but whatever. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really cool. Um, I did find that it is much more gold than you would think. Um, like mm. that, that is the color I would call it. It is gold more than it is yellow. Uh, that, you know, the back is metallic. So that's one thing that adds to it. The base is clearly gold, like meant to be, but all of it is a bit like darker and richer than you might have thought. Um, so if you're, if you're imagining it's gonna be like a daisy yellow, that's really just the front, like the pastel yellow that is on the front of the screen is truly, yeah, I'm saying the word yellow a lot but it is truly yellow. And then the back, yeah, it's, it's more towards gold. So just any, anybody looking at that one, be aware. Yeah. Cause they're doing this weird, like two tone deal where the back of the case is this dramatic saturated color and then the foot and the front. And I guess the keyboard and trackpad and everything have that, that lighter version. Uh, yeah. I think so, I mean, if you count all the colors, there's really, I guess there's, it's tritone. There'd be, there'd be three going on because there's the back and the stand and the front and they're all different. And then like, I'm looking at the mouse right now and the bottom of the mouse matches the base of the iMac and then the little slippery plastic pads, um, those match the front. Uh, so across all the accessories and stuff, there's really, 
three co- no there's a fourth because the cables are also a slightly different tone as well um so in the yellow they're they're lighter they're like a, a okay. kind of a brighter and one thing that actually i didn't know was going to be included in the box that is that same matching yellow is a uh lightning cable usb c to oh, lightning nice. to charge the uh trackpad or mouse or mm-hmm. keyboard and everything that you've got and yeah great that it matches everything like that. I don't think they announced that. I don't think it was in any of the trailers. So it just, that was one of those little, you know, surprise and delight moments where it's like, oh, mm-hmm. like, cool. They, they thought of this extra detail. I don't have to have a black cable running from the back of my computer, something that doesn't match. So I like that. Yeah. I know with my Mac Pro, I got one of those that was the black fabric. It's like, this mm-hmm. is the nicest lightning cable I've ever mm-hmm. owned. Mm-hmm. Like I keep it in my yeah. desk drawer. I use it for the keyboard and trackpad. Uh, yes, yeah, that's a, that's a nice touch. Um, I, I do want to ask you a little bit about the the cable situation because they've brought magnets to the iMac. And so this thing uh, pulls into the back of the iMac and it's got power and Ethernet if yours is configured that way. Yeah. Uh, just how's just that don't experience? call it MagSafe. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I think that's, again, there's some confusion there because people are like, oh, it's MagSafe. Like I recognize it. So it's the same thing as what we had before. And it's definitely not. It's uh, which they are not calling it right. Like Apple is not calling it made safe. So um, I think it's it should be judged as its own thing because it is not meant to to quick release for that safety. Right. Because like <laughs> now, what is safe becomes a little bit different, right? Like if your if your cable cable is getting ripped out of your desktop computer, that means the safety can be about your losing all your files. Um, so it is a much stronger magnet than the traditional MagSafe stuff and. Uh, you've really got to tug at it. Like it, it can, it can take some weight. It's not just going to pop off. It's at least as firm as the pressure of a traditional, you know, just plastic going into plastic okay. uh, plug. So, uh, but I mean, much more engineered, like you look at it and it's not just like one part. It's not just a plug with magnets. There is stuff going on in there. Um, I should, I should make sure that to take some like close up photos of it. Cause it's just crazy. Like there's, there's all these little details of something that are, are making up the inside of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, so in the end, I'm, I'm almost not, I'm not totally sure why they did it. Like it's cool, but does it do, does it serve a purpose? I'm not really sure. It's just nice. Yeah. I wonder if it has to do with the depth of the machine that a traditional power plug or traditional ethernet port would be too thick. And we were joking before we hit record that your headphones are plugged into the side of that computer (laughs) because the three point, the 3.5 millimeter Jack is too long for the computer itself because the computer is so thin. And so maybe they can make where there's that indention where the magnets go, they can make that thinner. It does seem like a lot of engineering for a power cable, but Mm -hmm. that's what Apple does sometimes. Yeah. I, I do think it's really smart separating the the, the power brick, uh, which is from the response that I've heard from people that repair computers is like, this is great because that's the thing that fails. So many machines show up because there's an issue with the power converter that is inside of the back of an iMac. Um, my iMacs, because uh, well, we sold one, but we had two like old iMacs, 2013, I think they are. Like They're getting pretty old, but I still use it. Um, and it's had to go in a few times and usually I think it has been connected to the power and they have to replace it. And that's also where a lot of the heat is inside of the machine. Mm-hmm. So that's where a lot of the fan requirements come from. So by separating it and putting it on the floor, putting it under your desk or whatever, like they're, they're getting some real functional benefits other than just making it thinner. It's not just visual that I, I think they pull that out for. Um, and I do think that that ethernet plug is a good idea. Like I really like that. Um, especially if you full-time have ethernet, like not having it plugged into the back of your machine is like aesthetically a lot nicer. You know, it's like one Mm -hmm. less permanent, ugly cable running out of the back. Um, so I'm all for it. I I really think that was a a bit of a stroke of genius. And, um, it's almost too bad that there is a, uh, the, the lower end, like the lowest end iMac, uh, that doesn't have that, uh, it doesn't have all the colors. I'm almost like, what did you have to do that one? I guess that's for like, that's for the schools. I, I, yeah. I don't know, but hit, hit get, the price, point, price point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can, I think you can spec the ethernet as like an option on the cheapest one, but you're right. Uh, the, the, some of the colors are locked away to the, 
the higher two models. And I mean, that part isn't super new. I mean, Apple did that a lot in the iPod days, right? Like, oh, you can get a nano in any color at four gigabytes as long as it's black. And if you want all these other colors, you got to go to eight <laughs> gigabytes or whatever. Right. Uh, but even back in like the iMac G3 days, a computer that I definitely love and has a special place in my heart, if you wanted like the the DV with like the Firewire, maybe it was just in graphite. And if you wanted that color, that finish, it was locked to certain price points. Or for a long time towards the end, the cheap one was Indigo, which was like this dark, rich blue. And if you wanted anything else, it was going to cost more. And so Apple has that in their DNA to a degree. Um, I was kind of hoping we had moved past it when the rumors were that this iMac was going to come in a bunch of colors because this was pretty heavily rumored. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I guess that is what it is. And I think where they split the colors in particular the you know the silvers the blues the reds they're going to be the most popular ones i think and yep. not everyone's going to want yellow or or orange Nobody's which i think is yellow. the best <laughs> i think they're i love these like punchy ones and we are going to see them a lot like in tv for example and in photo shoots oh, yeah. and styling like for set stylists like this is amazing this is going to be everywhere and i love that about it uh you know for people that want to be a bit more adventurous like this I don't know. It's it's almost like hard to describe how how much I love this because it's so much of what Apple was doing when many of us fell in love with them of like they can be the fun company. And it's weird that there still was an opportunity to do that like we are so far into computers and still in 2021 Apple can be the ones to be like look we can just you know turn over the Apple card and still mm -hmm. let's make this fun and nobody else was really there. And it, you know compared to the idea of having like a bunch of RGB fans inside of your gaming PC this is much more <laughs> elegant and much much better executed. So There's room for that too. Uh yeah, I mean Not yeah, Apple books. even even <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at the PC I built on the other side of my office. Yeah. Uh, even in the keynote, Apple said, you know, hey, these are used a lot uh, in these different settings. And iMacs are just out in the world a lot. I know they also spoke about that uh, in some interviews with Apple on Upgrade uh, over on Relay FM, this little podcast network that, you know, people just check out. Um, saying that, you know, these are in stores. You walk into a nice hotel, there's an iMac at the desk. And... And now, to your point, it can become part of the aesthetic. It can become part of the the flow of these spaces. And I guarantee you we're going to see a bunch of those that, yeah, this particular hotel bought the green one because that's what worked with their lobby. And that mm -hmm. is cool, right? People yeah. can can express themselves that way. And I think there's no there's no accident in Apple's marketing that so much of it has to do with you know, someone just sitting back at an iMac and the color and the way it flows into the room is front and center of a lot of their product photography on the website, because that's how people are going to think about this. And that is just, it's fun and exciting and, and new. Uh, the, the thing I, I, I wonder with the iMac G3 came out, all of a sudden you could buy like a toaster with, you know, blue plastic on it, right? It was just everywhere. It's like, what's going to be that this time? Like six months from now, could I go into a Target and, you know, buy a, a, a fancy trash can that is right. available in a bunch of different anodized aluminums? <laughs> you know, totally, yeah. There's been like designer stuff like that. Like um, Smeg does uh, kettles and fridges and they've always had this same vibe. And it was very like designery, like these are expensive and only interior designers really know about them or would buy them because it's so bold. But I think you're right that now like that's going to just show up and be a mm -hmm. thing everywhere. So uh, I'm going to yeah. be getting a yellow fridge next. But this episode is also brought to you by Mixkit, which is a great place to get free resources for your next project, especially video projects, but all sorts of different things. Whatever you're making, you can get stock video, music, sound effects, or video templates. And they have a ton of them. And did I, did I mention they're free? I mean, that's hard to come by. It's like good stock footage that is actually free and fully licensed. So you don't have to worry about licenses. I mean, you can just like pull videos off YouTube if you want, but you don't have a license to that. You're not allowed to use it. So even if you're doing commercial projects, Mixkit is going to give you the license that you need to use their stuff. And there's a ton of good stuff in here. So I'm just going through some of the stuff they have right now. I like that they have specifically vertical shots, something I'm 
always on about is that there are tons of campaigns that are vertical and they've thought about this and have some free vertical shots that you can download and use in your next project. It couldn't possibly be easier to use. So I'd highly recommend go check out Mixkit right now, mixkit.co slash r slash Stallman to let them know that you heard about them on the show. Thanks again, Mixkit for supporting this podcast. What do you think about sort of the colors and the, the longer term? And we have these finishes now. Do you think that this will be something Apple changes over time and evolves? They certainly did that with the G3. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they did it with the iPods, you know, very famously, like the big deal when a new iPod Nano came out was what colors is it available in? Do you see do you see that Apple's left room for themselves to change this over time? Or you think this is kind of going to be the iMac in these, you know, six colors plus silver for a while? Yeah, that's a good point. Like I, it would be weird for them. There's not a lot of room for them to just drop that many new colors into the into the existing line. Right. Mm -hmm. They could give us a purple. They could give us a, I don't know what else is like missing, a black. They could. Yeah. Um, Flower camel. power could bring that back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's like, there's a few, but it, it does seem like they might need to relaunch the whole line to really give us the new colors. And I don't think that'll be at the same rate that they were doing it for uh, I pods which you would know better how often they yeah rebooted I mean, in the, its heyday it was every fall it was like yeah, every holiday thought, season, every year like, there's, oh, a, new there's a new finish that's not gonna i don't think that'll happen no. at all um so i imagine yeah i don't know good question maybe it's gonna last every you know like four or five years till there's some Sig some internal bump that they need to signify on the outside so that people can be like yeah. oh you've got the blank version you've got the m Mm -hmm. the 12 uh, processor in there. And you can tell just by that it's in this new line of pastels or whatever it is. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think they've, they, they've mostly filled out like, here's what we're going to have for a while. And we're going to casually drop in one or two more over the years. But um, this is probably about what, what we have to offer. And look, anybody listening, please don't buy the silver. Like we've had That's silver so for boring. so long. What are you Go doing? get a color. <laughs> Go live life. Have yeah. a red computer. Yeah. yeah, live a little. <laughs> totally. I want some like real two tone ones where it's like a yellow base and a purple back or like, let me, yeah. let me make something ugly. I think that'd be really fun. Yeah. You know, if you're a huge Lakers fan, you can just go do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not, which is why I didn't even think of uh, that. That's what those colors are, but yeah. Uh, the, the other thing I think about when I think about the colors is where else could they show up and I think the MacBook Air, and it's been rumored a little bit, but I think the MacBook Air is like next in line for these sorts of things. I could really see Apple moving to this, this layout of their line where the consumer models are marked by these, these colors, this fun, and the pro stuff becomes a little more mm -hmm. serious uh, or stays a little more serious, I should say, because for so long, either the cheapest MacBook Air all the way to the biggest MacBook Pro basically looked the same, right? It was silver or space gray eventually. Sometimes a gold was thrown into the, the MacBook Air line, but I would love the MacBook Air to adopt this, this style, right? And I think it would say, hey, this is the consumer line. It would tie the iMac and the MacBook Air together in a way we haven't seen totally, in yeah. Apple's consumer line in over a decade, if not, if not over two decades. I don't know. Like, do you, do you think this would work in sort of a notebook environment? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I would love to see the outside shell is that deep, rich, saturated color. You open it up and maybe like the keyboard area is our second tone. That's a little bit more muted. And then there's a white bezel around the screen. I mean, it's gonna, they're going to be white because they've decided they're going to be white. But like, I think that would look awesome. And just the fun of it is is worth it to me. Like it, everything yeah. doesn't need to be boring. Uh, I'm totally happy about that. There are, yeah, colorful options out there. I mean, it, it's funny. It's like, it's such a, it's um, such a big part of what this new computer is. There's only so much you can really say about it because most of it's visual. It's like, you don't need to talk about it. Just look at it. That's the mm -hmm. fun. So, Well, that's but kind of the statement Apple made to a degree, right. I think of, you know, they open this by saying this is the first Mac we've built around Apple Silicon. And then they it comes into frame. You see it's whatever it is, 11 and a half millimeters thin, which is mind boggling. <laughs> As like, yeah, we could build this because of our technology inside of it. And it's super colorful. So, you know, instantly that it's different. It's like, yeah, it does kind of speak for itself in terms of design and kind of stands apart from what came before.
Yeah, I can't wait to see a computer lab. Like if you go to a, a school or a, a library or whatever, and they get all the different colors. Hopefully, they don't just all get all gray. But uh, it looks so <laughs> cool to have a full room of these. And that's what my experience was when I first went to college. Was a library full of the which was the iMac with the ARM uh, what, uh, the what, G4. Yeah, so it was all those, and it looked so cool. Like it was yeah. very exciting and inspiring. And I think there's been some discussion around like, well, you know, these are these are going to be fun for mainstream audiences, but they're not really for like creators or like people that like need to get work done on their machine. Like they need a serious, powerful something, something. But that's part of what I think this M1 revolution is going to be is like you got to st- everybody starts with a cheaper computer. And mm-hmm. so this is going to be a lot of people's first computer that they start doing professional work on. And what's great about the M1 is you can go all the way there. You're not going to, you know, like let's, let's create the scenario of somebody that wants to be a filmmaker and they're just getting started. They just are in their first year of school. They don't know if they can make a real run at it yet, make it enough money to start buying expensive gear, but they go out and they buy the most affordable iMac and they're able to edit 4k on it multiple streams with color great. They can do everything professionals do and there's nothing mm-hmm. holding them back even though they bought the cheapest computer, even though they bought a MacBook Air. They can do all the same stuff that the pros are doing. So this will be the first computer that so many people get started on and same with programming and uh, uh, pho- photography and sound engineering, whatever it is. What, whatever the pla- the thing that your computer is a platform for, it will now be able to handle it without slowing you down or keeping you from moving forward in your career. And that is uh, enormous. And I think we're going to look back on it in, I mean, it's a much, in a much smaller way, but similar to how everybody having an iPhone in their pocket means like we're getting all these 16 year old, incredible creators that are making TikTok videos that have more interesting ideas in it than the films that are streaming right now. Like, you know, it, it really does open up huge yeah. possibilities. Um, and this is the machine that it will happen on for a lot of people just getting started. Yeah. Apple's always been into the idea of, uh, democratizing high technology, right? Bringing technology that enables people to do things. I mean, you go all the way back to like the Apple two days, the original Macintosh, um, all the way through to today. Like that's at the core of what Apple how Apple sees the Mac in particular. I think the iPad is in there too a little bit, but especially the Mac is like, we can take this great technology, we can put it in something that a lot of people can afford, not necessarily everybody, unfortunately, but a lot of people, they can put it in schools to your point. And I mean, that's that's how I came to love the Mac. You know, I came mm-hmm. to it in high school doing like the student newspaper. And when it clicked for me was like, oh, I can use this, you know, at the time, like an iMac G3 or a beige Mac, you know, the much older computers, but I can use them to take something in my head and put it in the hands of readers. Right. And, and in a way, like that's described my career up to today. I think that's true for a lot of people. I think it's true for you. Like we're interested in these things because they are tools to get us where we want to go creatively. And this iMac, it kind of brings that into this new era that the now the floor, the basement of performance on Macs moving forward can do 4K, can do all of these things. And it does it in like a fun enclosure that, you know, it can kind of become part of your not only aesthetic in the your workspace, but if you're a video creator and you have one of these, it's going to be in the background of a bunch of your shots, right? Because yeah. it's a splash of color and it it brings life to the room in a way and all that's really exciting. It's a really old idea, but the reason this iMac excites me is that it, it brings that idea into the 21st century in a way that honestly, I didn't expect when they announced it. And the more I think on it and I've got one coming to me to review, um, I'm excited to get it in and and see how it fits into that narrative that Apple has been telling now for, you know, 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard time not to be a bit fanboy about, the Mac specifically, which like there was a long time that it was a bit of a dry spell in, in the Mac world. It was oh, all yeah. iPad, not all iPhone. And the, they did not forget about the Mac, thankfully. I mean, I think it was, I think it was right around when I was starting the podcast, actually, that we were in that slightly dead area era of like 
the laptops aren't super fast. Keyboards mm -hmm. are having problems. Like there's just a lot of reasons to not be excited about the new Macs coming out. Oh yeah. And I spent a little while thinking about switching, which seems crazy to me. Like I am absolutely a Mac person, but we were really, there, there was nothing happening. It was really mm -hmm. dull for a while. And I am just, I'm just so excited about it right now. Like I'm, I'm very into what's happening. Yeah. So I, I like that. Um, but I feel like, I mean, there's more things going on. So I feel like we don't have to take this whole time to only talk about IMAX. <laughs> did you get some air tags? Uh, I did. Uh, I got some air tags. I got them on my keys, my wife's keys. I put one in my truck just to see what that would be like. Um, and then my wife drove my truck to run some errands. It was like, there's an air tag following me around. I was like, oh, sorry. That's me. Uh, I'm not stalking you. Um, you know, in a way, the air tags are not super exciting because they've been just like on the cusp of being released forever. Like we kind of know what they're going to be. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing that, that is sort of frustrating to me, at least, and maybe to a lot of other people, if you're in like an iCloud family sharing situation is they're definitely a product designed for one person. Like I can't see my spouse's air tags. And I understand that from a privacy perspective, but it'd be great if there were an option, right? Because I can see where she is and I can see where all of her devices are. But if she lost her keys and we were out and like, you know, or lost her bag, which I also mm -hmm. stuck an air tag in, uh, we'd have to like take my phone, log out, log in as her Apple ID. And like, there's some friction there. Um, and I think yeah. Apple was wise to do what they could do in terms of privacy and safety because this is a device that could be used for some really bad things but i'd like a little more flexibility in sort of on the family side yeah i thought i thought that's how it was going to work at first was that it would just be totally shared and you know one you, you you could add it to everybody and realizing that you can't set it up like that was a letdown because i had exactly the same plan. And I almost wonder if they are just taking it slow. They're like, well, let's be very conservative about mm -hmm. this, see what the response is like, see how people end up using it, see where the pain points are. Um, one thing that was a, f a fun one is I, I figured out that I can actually hide an AirTag in the, there's like a little padding on my C70 on my bigger video <laughs> camera where the grip is, <laughs> and I could slide it inside. So it's just like, now all of a sudden my camera also has tracking on it without attaching anything to dangle to around it. the outside. It's like in yeah. there. I'm like, oh yeah, that, that feels pretty good. I like that one. <laughs> That's um, hilarious. Uh, yeah, but the one attaching those... it to things is is definitely part of the experience, right? Apple sells yeah. a bunch of stuff. If you go to Etsy right now, there were 3 million 3D printed products of like attach it to this, attach it to that. Um, I think we'll kind of see where that settles out. But, uh, you know, well, like I've got a Belkin keychain that's fine. Yeah. I think we're going to kind of forget about our air tags for the next uh, 12 months until all the batteries die. And then be like, oh, yeah, right. I have all these air tags everywhere. And, you know, <laughs> like, I uh, have I needed it yet? I, I don't think I actually really needed it yet. I've kind of triggered it where I'm like, I don't know where my keys are, even though I kind of I kind of know when I just like make, make yeah. them beep so I can find a little faster. But I haven't required one uh, up mm -hmm. to this point. So we'll we'll see what that's like. Um but that's kind of what the product's going to be. It's going to be like one of those things, like you buy some, forget about it. And hopefully it doesn't feel like too much of a burden to go track them all down and remember that the batteries are dead when they are, uh, because otherwise they are not that useful, which is what happened yeah. with the tiles. The tiles that I had were not battery replaceable, so they just died and I forgot they even existed. Mm -hmm. now, you know, it's probably yeah, one of I, I do think seat. the AirTags will send you a notification when the battery is getting low, which is good. Uh, the other thing for me, at least, is I haven't done any traveling yet. Uh, and the before times, I did a lot of travel for work. I haven't done any. And so it's only so useful, like when my backpack goes from my studio to my house, which is <laughs> 10 feet that way, right? Yeah. It's only so useful when I don't drive anywhere, so my keys never leave the counter. So I feel like there's this sort of second experience with air tags that a lot of people have It'll you know, in. when yeah. travel really picks up again. And I, I kind of wonder if that's maybe one of the reasons this didn't come out. You know, if it had come out a year ago, we'd be like, why? Do do know, a year ago, we were all mm -hmm. locked down at home. And and now that the world's opening back up a little bit, maybe uh, maybe Apple thought it was time to finally start shipping them. But if you look at some of the boxes and literature, it's like, you know, 2019 stamped all over it. So yeah, it's kind of it's always kind of funny to wonder, you know, how long have these been 
ready to go. Well, we'll we'll have to come back to them in about a year. Um, anything else you've been using? Is there anything just like not even Mac? I don't have anything about to say about the iPad yet. I'm going to wait till I try one. So I'll circle back to that some other day. Um, yeah. But like, I don't know. What else you what else you've been doing lately? How's Relay going? How's podcasting? What's yeah. up in your world? Yeah, podcasting is great. You know, we entered the pandemic very nervous about what that would do to the business and the whole. I mean, I think anyone who works in like creative industry, we were all like, it's over. You it know? stopped for a it's, minute. Yeah. Um, and, and that, and that's really, uh, hasn't been the case for us. We launched a membership program and that's been absolutely amazing. And so really the, the last year for, for me in particular at Relay, it has been that membership program and focusing on that. Um, and it's been great. It, it's really been successful and it's fun to, to get to know our listeners better. And so really, I feel like the last year has really given me, the ability to really focus on like the core of the business. Like I paused a lot of side projects I was doing. Um, obviously not having any travel, you know, travel is, as you know, there's like the work you do when you travel. And then there's the two to three times the amount of work you have to do just so you can travel right on the, on the front end and back end, it feels like. And without that stuff, it's like, yeah, just here making our shows, improving our content management system, working on the membership. And so, it's really been a surprisingly solid year in the podcast business, at least for us. Well, so now that it's been a little while, what's your take on Apple's announcements about uh, paid podcast options? I mean, it's directly into the world that you've been yeah. doing through, I think you guys use Memberful probably. Mm -hmm. um, there have been more solutions out there. I've been looking at some for some uh, like different podcast ideas I would had for, yeah, like some, you know, for pay shows. Um, mm -hmm. Sitting on it after Apple's announcement, uh, when I first talked about it on this show, I wasn't sure if they were going to be available on other podcast apps. It was a bit of a question at that moment because it was just announced. And now that we're aware that they are only on Apple Podcasts, yeah, it has become completely uninteresting to me in any way, um, yeah. which is really too bad. Yeah. it, it For shows like ours, it, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. I mean... I don't know about you. I could venture a guess that you have a huge percentage of people using third-party applications like totally. Overcast or Castro or Pocket Casts. Yep. Uh, that's certainly true of most relay shows. I mean, there's some mm -hmm. relay shows where uh, those third-party apps just dwarf the listenership in Apple Podcasts. But that's pretty unique to our little corner of the industry. If you look at mainstream big shows, Apple Podcast is really the the biggest platform that people listen on. And so if you have a show like that and you're not already doing direct support, I could see it being a, a reasonable option. I do not think 30% is reasonable. I just, that is mm -hmm. infuriating to me. Mm -hmm. uh, even the 15 you drop to, like I could live with that, but I wouldn't be thrilled about it. But the thing that just makes it a non-starter for us is that it is, completely within the Apple ecosystem. And so not only does it lock third-party applications out, but stuff like we do, like our member Discord, which has thousands of people in it, we couldn't do that mm -hmm. for members who purchase through Apple because just like the App Store, Apple owns the relationship, if you will. So we don't, we wouldn't know who our customers are. Where if you sign up through Memberful, you know, we have your email address and you get an email and you sync it to discord and you do all these extra things that apple's solution just doesn't really have any accounting for apple has built really what they've built is a podcast store or a marketplace and i think those of us on the outside have tried to like look at it through the lens of how our membership programs work and i just don't think that's what apple's built i'm right. not saying what they built is bad but it's it's not a fit for us at this at this point and i don't yeah. think it ever would be unless they radically changed how they approached it. I just have a hard time thinking of who it would be for. Like, it, it just feels like when I think about the big shows and I think about the small shows, I can so quickly rule it out for, for, for most shows that I can imagine, which I, you know, I would rather be working with Apple on it than Spotify, but it feels like Spotify has been moving in a more open direction where their new yeah. offering is going to be more of a true podcast and uh, available on RSS feeds. Um, so that's, 
I don't know. It's, it's really interesting. The, the ones that I was looking at, what I really like that uh, I probably would use if I get around to this project would be Supercast that mm-hmm. can tie into Memberful as well. And that is to, I mean, what I like about it is it's like, it's straight ahead. It's like, look, you have, you collect people's money and you give them an RSS feed that is yep. secure for them. And it's very straightforward. And th- that's exactly what I want. And, um, yeah. you know, the 30% that is frustrating about Apple I'd feel a little more okay about if I was like, well, but they're taking care of everything for me and I can just get this out to everyone, which, you know, like I say, Supercast is, but you, you pay a different fee structure. Um, that kind of service would be much more like, because th- there are there are things that I've done, like when I launched my uh, LUTs, like my presets for sale, That what was great about that, it was very impulse. I knew that other people used Selfie, which is the service that I'm selling it through, uh, SL. S-E-L-L-F-Y. And the fact that I was able to get that up and going in half an hour, you know, so I had the presets ready. I'm like, oh, like the store already exists. So I just need to put a little (laughs) packaging on this. And it was launched. I I mean, I went from using them personally myself to, you know, being able to sell them to my audience within two hours. And that was amazing. And that is the whole reason I was able to do it. And it's been good. It like people have been interested and end up working out pretty well. Um, so I'm going to double down on that and do more LUTs coming forward in the next year. And, um, yeah, and looking at doing podcast options. And so there's, there's something very valuable about making it dead simple. Like I don't need to plan out a whole website and make this a project. I can just Mm -hmm. launch it and that's not what we got. So I I don't know. I'm still, I I, I don't know if mine will be coming (laughs) soon, but I, I, even though there are so many offerings for it right now, I feel like we're still just at the beginning of it. And also Twitter's about to get into this game too. I saw uh, they that. Just, yeah, like the th- so they announced the $3, I don't remember what they called it. Twitter the, Blue. Like, right, it was like Pro, like Twitter Pro. And yeah. it lets you undo tweets if you pay $3 a month. <laughs> but, you, but you still can't, can't edit, edit them. edit them yet. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> That'll be $6 a month next year. Uh, yeah. yeah, and you know, something you said struck me uh in the apple podcast system if you're in the paid system this new this new thing you have to upload the files manually so you can't like ingest an rss feed like memberful can uh but it is doing some smart stuff and so if you have say that you had a apple podcast paid version of this show and your free show if someone switches over to the paid version it just brings in those episodes that, you know, maybe ad free or longer, you know, whatever your content offering is. And so it can mesh those things where, and we've had this on relay. If someone listens to connected and they become a member of connected pro, it's a totally separate RSS feed. Right. And yeah. it's not like super clear about, okay, when, when does like the pro version, like what episode did that start with? And you got to buy great people over and, you know, it's as easy as it could be through memberful, but it's still, those manual steps and if you're all in the apple ecosystem they take care of that from the user perspective it's just a little more work on the creator side of things and so i'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see how that pans out as as of right now it hasn't launched yet it's supposed to be the end of may i think is when podcasters will begin to be able to sign up and and play with it but i think for you know certain types of shows and creators it, it could make sense but i think you know, those of us who commentate on it for a living, uh, it's just, it's not, uh, it's not the thing for us. Um, I, I do think though, you know, you mentioned Spotify as well and their, their sort of paid offering is more open. I think Apple and Spotify kind of battling this out is super interesting yeah. because for so and long, it, Apple's been like the us. sleeping giant mm-hmm. with no real other giant company moving into the space. And all of a sudden Spotify's here and, you know, they do some stuff that I like and do some stuff I don't like, just like any other platform. But to have someone kind of in the ring with Apple at their size and podcasting is something we have never had before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I just hope they don't. I mean, this is what we've been saying for a while, but they don't break it. And that it yeah. the, the openness and the um, ability for anybody to get into it just sticks around. I really don't want that to change. Yeah, um, and I think them saying, hey, this membership stuff or paid stuff, you can get it as an RSS feed. Like that's a great sign. And I wonder if some of that is in, in, in purposeful contrast to Apple and you know, we'll see where all that, that goes. Uh, you know, we definitely see Spotify in our download numbers and, uh, people are using it 
Uh, and I think that they, they clearly are very serious about it. You don't throw that kind of money around if you're not in it for the long haul. So, you know, what does that look like in a few years? It's is anybody's guess, but it certainly is. I think good for Apple if they move into these sort of paid services to have another company there as direct competition, because it, it may keep Apple more in line where the market wants them. Well, as a podcast fan and and listener, what has your experience been in, in paying for shows? Like which shows have you paid for outside of Relay, which are, are all worth it? Oh, gosh. But, um, like what else has been good? Yeah. I mean, the... You know, I think a lot of your audience will know, like, do by Friday with our friends mm -hmm. Merlin and Alex. They've had a Patreon for a long time, yeah. which is really how a lot of people have done this up until things like Memberful and and these other platforms have have come up. And that's is, for a second is, show, right? Like the after yeah. after dark kind of. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so that's something that I've enjoyed for for a long time. And of course, Patreon owns Memberful now, but they're both like very easy from a consumer standpoint. You mm -hmm. know, Apple has the standards of like, oh, well, you use store kits. You just use Face ID and we already have your credit card. Well, like giving Memberful a payment method through Apple Pay isn't hard, right? Like, a, and doing Patreon the same way isn't difficult. And so these other systems definitely have uh, a good leg to, to stand on. But yeah, Do By Friday definitely stands out for me as, as a show that I happily give money to each month. Right, yeah. Yeah, the... the gold standard I've been looking at has been dithering, which uh, yes. was like, was very worth it to me because we've got two, you know, heavy hitters in the, in the tech space that have often have, it's one of those things where like the, the real value of them is that they have ideas that many of us don't come to on our own. There's a lot of like, as you go around hearing different conversations where, uh, especially like Ben just blows me away when he's, he'll, he'll drop ideas that as soon as he says, I'm like, that is so obvious to me now, and I've never heard anybody <laughs> express that idea before, but it's so clear once he's articulated yeah. it. Um, and also challenging me on ideas I may have, you know, thought were self-evident. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed that format also that it comes often and it's short means I do end up listening to each episode, um, yeah. which can be a challenge of other longer shows. Like, so an, another one I've dipped in and out of is The Wandering DP, which is a cinematography podcast. Also, probably a lot of people that listen to the show have also listened to that. And he um, is like just kind of giving away all the secrets of cinematography. It's, it's, it's definitely worth it, but they are, they're all, you know, full length episodes. Plus he has the mm -hmm. normal podcast. Plus I listen to a lot of other podcasts. So I kind of just don't stay subscribed to the, the Patreon one because I start falling behind. I'm like, Oh, well I got, I got too many shows. Right. I didn't listen for the last two months. So then I drop it and then I come back a year mm -hmm. later and, and like kind of catch up on it a little bit as well. So, yeah. um, it's, I mean, it's really interesting having this whole new world of ways to, to make an income from what we've seen on Substack, It seems like there is amazing potential. If you have that, you know, that thousand true fans, if you really do have an audience to support you, um, putting something out that they find valuable can become mm -hmm. a career, which is yeah. wonderful. And what's interesting too, especially with dithering is that it is a paid product, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like something like our membership where all of our content is free. If you just want ad free longer versions, then you pay five bucks a month or whatever. Or dithering launched as if you want this, you're going to subscribe to it. And I was way, like, yeah. you, I was like day one, I am there. Uh, yeah. And I think we're going to see more of that. I think we, I think it's definitely possible. We see creators experiment with that through Apple Podcasts even, because you can do you can do content in Apple Podcasts, the paid section, and have it elsewhere as well. They don't make you just put it in the Apple ecosystem. And so as these tools evolve, I think we'll continue to see people play with the idea of, well, what if the the whole thing is, is paid? Viewing a mm -hmm. podcast or a piece of content like, you know, something like what you're selling with your LUTs, right? It's, it's yeah, I'm going to pay for that because it's a, I think about it as differently than you think about a podcast, right? But in reality, that doesn't have to be the case. And so I think as all this continues to grow, people will experiment and some stuff will work and some won't. But uh, that's all really exciting because mm -hmm. we don't need every podcast to be the format of something like what we do. You know, it's an hour and a half conversational stuff. There's lots of that. I, that's most of what I listen to. It's how I prefer podcasts to be. But that doesn't mean that something like, what Ben and John do is not also perfectly valid and perfectly enjoyable and well worth the subscription and all that stuff can coexist all at once. It's not like there's winners and losers. 
Yeah, it's interesting because like with yeah, Ben and John's show, it's I think there's less total content per month than many of the free shows I listen to, like in, in time. Oh, yeah. But especially now they drop down. Now they're doing two episodes a week instead of three. And each one's 15 minutes. And um, but it still it feels worth it. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's like it just depends on how it's sort of packaged and what it is. So yeah. um, you know, I think that's 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 great for the amount of of options for us to move into new places. Um, totally. Before you go as well, I just want to know what, what's your camera status these days? What are you shooting on? Yeah, so I, I'm rocking the Canon a7 III. Uh, my brother is trying to talk me into the a7S III. But is that, I the, is that the, the Sony a7S III? It is. Oh, okay. I know. It's a Canon, but... Oh, did I? Yeah, sorry. That's my bad. <laughs> but yeah. on a podcast yeah, with a yeah, camera so... guy. Uh, yes, the Sony. And um, you talked about your Canons earlier, and I think there's one sitting there in front of you, so it's just on my mind. Yeah, uh, it is. But yeah, yeah, I'm I'm in the Sony world. I have a couple of the new uh the the ZV1, which is sort of like they mm-hmm. took the RX100 and kind of remixed it a little bit. I've got a couple of those that I'm using for uh some Twitch streaming I've been doing. Uh they're way better than a webcam for that, but uh still have some issues with like okay, yeah, they'll run forever on the battery, but if you have power to them, they'll overheat and you know, there's always pros and cons but it's still firmly in the in the sony world well and what uh an interesting thing too is that you're sort of doing the inverse of me of like podcasting is your main thing and you yeah. do youtube because you love it and for me it's like youtube is my main thing and i podcast because i love it um mm-hmm. how's how's youtube been like what uh, are you focusing on it more or less or like what what's your yeah feeling as a youtuber right now it, it's been very quiet i mean like i said about a you know a little over a year ago when the pandemic sort of cranked up, I was like, hey, I need to focus on relay. And I made a, a mm-hmm. conscious decision to pause some other stuff. Uh, but now as we're coming out of it and relay is, is healthy and doing very well. Uh, that is what I'm looking to pick back up. In fact, I ordered an iMac as sort of my way back into YouTube, um, doing some, some stuff with that. Uh, the, the Twitch streaming really kind of came out of nowhere for me. My co-founder, Mike Hurley, has been doing some of it. We were doing some of it uh, every fall. We raised money for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We were doing some streams around that. And it was so refreshing to me because my podcasts are edited. My YouTube videos are edited. Twitch is just, it is what it is, right? Like it is live. You hit the button. You're talking to people. You hit the button and you're not talking to people. And it's done, right? It's Mm -hmm. finished. And so for me, that's been a fun medium to explore over the last year or so where maybe something doesn't fit somewhere else, but like, hey, I just want to take apart this computer and talk about it for 45 minutes. Twitch is a pretty good format for that. Uh, And so that's been sort of where my experimentation has been. And I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it that it's so vastly different than my other things, that it's live, that there is no editing that I think it's made me better at things that are edited as well. It's, right. it's made me a better sort of off the cuff speaker. And so that's really been sort of where I've been playing the last year or so. And I think that will definitely continue. I think that'll be part of something that I do just from, just from here on out, you know, whether it's, Hey, let's look at this weird Mac. Uh, right now I'm doing this series where I'm building like a Lego space shuttle very, very slowly. I could have had it done way faster than that. I wasn't doing it live on stream. But just kind of having this like unplugged, just as, you know, as it happens type thing is, has been a fun break. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I totally uh, appreciate that sort of the practice of streaming, which is similar to how I think about the conversations of podcasting compared to doing the YouTube videos where I do take after take and I, you know, let myself make more mistakes. But here it's like, you got to keep talking, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, th- and, and that's, I find that very helpful to have more than one frame of mind. Cause if you really like just lean into one way of performing, uh, you can kind of get stagnant and, uh, stop growing. So yeah, I, I like that too. I be, well, I, often these shows are streamed as well, which the, this one wasn't today. If anybody wants to usually watch them though, um, you know, head over to youtube.com slash Stallman podcast and, Stephen, where can people find you? I mean, 512pixels is a good place. Yeah, 512pixels.net is uh, my blog. And I host a bunch of shows over on Relay FM. 
and including connected and Mac power users, which are definitely, uh, I think very much centered right now around what's going on with Apple <laughs> and this yeah. Mac renaissance we're enjoying. We're talking a lot about that on those shows. And uh, we will definitely be busy as WDC approaches really now oh, three I, weeks away. I keep forgetting how close it is. Like, because I'm, st I'm still caught up on what just got announced, I have not been thinking about WWDC, but that is very exciting when I do. Because I, what, what's going to happen? I don't really, I'm not following rumors, to be honest. I just like don't yeah. even look at rumors anymore. So. I mean, the software stuff is always hard to come by in rumors, right? Because you're not stamping software out of aluminum. And when you mm -hmm. do, that stuff is what leaks. You know, I don't know if we'll necessarily see like the M2 or whatever comes after the M1, the M1X, whatever it is. I'm not sure we're going to see more Mac hardware quite yet. But I, I hope at least that there's a focus on iPad software and making the iPad a yeah. better tool for those who want to work on it every day and that means things like the multitasking being less confusing and easier to use i think that means even better keyboard and trackpad support uh we've talked a lot about this on connected recently but also having like better external display support like if you want your ipad to be your laptop it should do all of those things really well for sure and what's so frustrating about the ipad is the hardware's always been good like take the m1 off the table and the new ipad pros yeah but even iPad Pros from 2016, 17, 18, all these iPads have been so fast for so yeah. long. It's the software that holds them back. And Apple sort of made a promise to users when they gave it a name. And they said, hey, iPad OS is what this thing is. It stands on its own apart from the iPhone. That comes with expectations. And I'm ho hoping that this year, Apple really makes a big move to meet those expectations. Because I think a lot of us are just, are just frustrated with the iPad software story. Yep. That's me for sure. I mean, mm -hmm. it's that, that thing of like, I keep pulling out and like, what can I do with this? <laughs> One of yeah. three or four things uh, I'd, I'd like more because the hardware is just so good. So yeah. Oh, a lot to look forward to. Well, thanks again for coming, Stephen. Yeah. Thanks for having me and uh good choice on the yellow. It's grown on me greatly since uh, seeing it now over camera. 